Two things to, uh, to note really so far this week. Tuesday I had my jab, Lady Cordana, who as I said in yesterday's more episode, she worked her way through her vaccines with incredible efficiency, like a match side sports shooter on motor wind. But the, uh, the biggest event this week is today. Our eldest, Jack, turns 13 years old. Teenager, the next six years. What does that bring me, those who've had teenagers? Don't tell me. Sam pulled out a, a picture that uh, showed one of the momentous moments in Jack's life so far. The day he had to have a sunflower removed from his ear, which apparently was thrown by one of his schoolmates. Yeah, amazing. Right the way across class. Ooh, not quite sure we ever believed him. Now, Jack doesn't really listen to this show, but I'm OK with that. I think a sort of meditative walk with our cameras for the photo walk edition of the week probably isn't the stuff of dreams for someone who's into his gaming and uh, F1. But if Lewis Hamilton et al. ever take up uh, photography as a hobby, he'll be all over it. But just in case he does listen, ever, one day, we don't really do birthday dedications, but I'm, I'm going to make this exception and say happy birthday, Jack. My darling boy, love you loads. More and more, every single day, even when you're being proper grumpy with me. And I know right now he'll say something like, Oh, Dad, you're so embarrassing. Play the jingle. Photography Daily, the Friday photo walk. Just a thought, when I said sunflower, I did mean sunflower seed lodged in his ear, not the complete plant. That would be odd. Welcome to the Friday Photo Walk, which is, I like to think, until proved otherwise, the only photo walk show of its type in the podcast sphere. It's a chance just to pick up your smartphone, download this edition, and stride out on a walk with me and your camera. We'll talk about the shows you've heard, the pictures you make, and hopefully share some inspiration along the way. Remember, you can see the pictures we talk about from subscribers or listeners, to use the old-fashioned lingo, who've sent in their photo walks that they've made when listening. And you can do the same for next week's show. I've been incorporating more and more mails and bits in the show, so do remember to keep sending yours in, otherwise it'll be a quiet one next week. To studio at photographydaily.show. Studio at photographydaily.show. What are we looking for? Stories about your photography, feedback on the shows, your wonderful pictures from the walks you make, the stuff that you've seen, books, TV shows, films, tip-offs, anything photographic that you think, hang on a moment, I'm sure somebody else would like to know about this. And obviously, send recipes for anything you can do with a Garibaldi biscuit, apart from dunk it in tea. The show is supported by our wonderful patrons and, of course, mpb.com, the number one platform for buying, selling and trading used camera gear with offices and warehouses now in Brighton, UK, Brooklyn, USA and now Berlin for Europe. If you're buying, selling or trading used kit, these are the people you can trust. And here's two reasons why. Number one, peace of mind when you're buying in the form of a guarantee. And two, money in your bank quickly when you sell. So if you like to buy, sell or trade used gear and be part of the ever-important photographic circular economy, mpb.com is a great place to do business. Right, boots on, check. Camera out of bag, check. Lens cap off, Uh check. Let's walk. I was talking about our Jack a moment ago, wasn't I? 13 years old today. And one thing that uh, has been a feature of our life during these extraordinary, horrible COVID times is that we obviously had our homeschooling days, a lot of them. And so it wasn't always easy to get out and do these photo walks when I really wanted to. The whole point of taking a walk with your camera, which this edition, the Friday edition, is all about, is that you can relax, take some time, stop occasionally, look out, wonder where the next picture is. I mean, I just saw some monk jacks uh, flying across the field next to me. No good for the uh, 28 millimeter on my Fuji X Pro One. Uh, they were far too far away that it that looked like dots. Remember I was telling you about my mum's famous red arrows shots where she'd show you uh, one of her pictures taken with the Kodak and she'd say, look, the red arrows. You'd say, what? Where, mum? There, there. What, those seven dots? Yeah, look, red arrows. Oh, thought your lens was dirty. But yeah, during the, the lockdown and 
certainly during the homeschooling period, I used to have to, well, not rush my walks, but certainly take my walks at a less leisurely rate than I really wanted to. So today, actually, um, and last week, to be fair as well, it's the first time I've really been able to just take my time, get out the house during the day, rather than when everybody got home so that uh, the kids weren't alone, and, uh, and make a photo walk. And there is something very meditative to it, isn't there? I've used that word twice today. No more, Neil. Just, just twice. Just taking your time, taking a few moments to yourself. And that's what this edition is all about. With our cameras, me with my microphone as well. And I found a track, I think. You know what I'm like. I like to find myself tracks which are just a, just a, a little bit quieter so I can uh, make my pictures in peace. Let's start with an email from Jim Solos. I was out for a casual walk, says Jim, on a nice day in the village where I live, which is a, a small historic town, very popular for shooting movies, actually. It's in British Columbia, isn't it? I was uh, reading something about uh, Vancouver, actually, Jim. Vancouver Island, close by. You have your own, it seems, Loch Ness Monster. And actually, Vancouver Island has uh, a lot of really intriguing folklore stories, doesn't it? I'm sure there must be a photo walk in that. Anyway, Jim says, uh, I was walking along a street by the old fort, along the river, lots of very nice homes lining the road. I have my camera in hand, bag over my shoulder, and a guy's out washing his car, and he comes over and says, can I ask what you're doing? Probably not in that accent, Jim, I appreciate it. I said, I'm taking some pictures. He said, why are you doing that? Without batting an eyelid, I said, uh, well, I work for da -da 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 studios. I'm scouting interesting homes for use in movies. If I see something I like, I take a photo, note the address, and we put it into a database for the movie producers. If they like a home, they approach the owner and offer five to $10,000 per day to use your place as a movie set. If you take them up on it, they put you into a first-class hotel, all expenses, including meals paid for the duration of the shoot. He looked at me, he said, can you include mine? I said, nah, not my style, and continued my walk with a mischievous grin all over my face. <laughs> I like your style, Jim. Yeah, that's the last thing you want when you're making pictures is somebody coming up saying, what are you doing? What's that for? So I, <laughs> I do understand your frustration. Here's one from uh, Wim Truyanit. Now, I hope I've got that right. Hello, Neil. I only recently discovered your podcasts while stumbling on an interview with Thomas Heaton, whose uh, YouTube videos are very enjoyable, very good photo inspiration. Yeah, Thomas Heaton, if you're not aware of him, is, I suppose he's like, well, it would be fair to say he's one of the, he's like the YouTube landscape masters, isn't he, really? Not necessarily in time that he's been making landscape pictures, but certainly in the following that he has and uh, just the sheer enthusiasm that he has also for, for his craft. On that subject, says Wim, have you uh, thought about interviewing Simon Baxter or Ben Horn, photographers who I think would be worth having a chat with? I'm on it, Wim. I'm on it. You know, when you send these names in, it's around about a two-month lead now, usually. Not always, but usually, until um, I have them on the show. Sometimes that changes, sometimes they get on earlier, but it's around about that much. So uh, when you send these names in, they uh, don't appear immediately, but uh, they certainly are on my radar. Wim says, uh, I'm from the Netherlands myself. Hold on. Just jump over that water. And hearing you mention uh, Hagelschlag, there we go, I'm doing my best again. Have I got that right? No, Harkel. It's, it's, a, it's a quieter K, isn't it? Harkel. That's how you say a G. Harkelschlag. Have I got that right? But hearing you mention it in your last... Uh, your last photo walk made me smile. I'm sure they have sugar added to them, but they're actually chocolate sprinkles. Ah, yeah, we were talking about um, this Dutch breakfast, which is uh, essentially sugar. <laughs> Hundreds and thousands, we used to call them, didn't we? Just sprinkled all across toast. A sugar fest. Never mind people saying that uh, the boxes of um, cereal contain sugar. I mean, this is uh, unashamedly just sugar. But I have to say, Wim, that uh, you're not entirely correct because, uh, yeah, uh, there they are the chocolate ones, but uh, 
there are loads aren't there there's like pure and milk and mixed um fruit ones you're forgetting the fruit one actually which is the the uncoated sugar one bigger sort of bigger puffs that uh well they're they're not just like sprinkles they're just big puffs of sugar check out the 400 gram de Reuchter sprinkles fruit 400 or is it de Reuchter? oh i'm doing my best here wim anyway two euros 99 ordered myself a packet should arrive in a month and there'll be an extra 40 quid of course on top for our bold new world of go it alone euro policy but it'll be worth it neil get over it i am wim says i want to comment on your pronunciation of dutch words I know it's a pain for most non-Dutch speakers. No, I love uh, I love the language, actually. And our friends who, who I talked about on last week's episode, it's one of those languages that's just... I know every, every language is fascinating to hear when you travel, but uh, there are some languages where you think, whoa, that's really impressive. And I, I always thought Uncle Jan and Daphne speaking Dutch. I said they used to argue in Dutch a lot with their, their sons. Well, because it's one of those languages you don't really hear very often... I find it quite fascinating to listen to. Anyway, says Wim, last year, not being able to travel much, my wife and I bought ourselves a little cabin in the, the more forestry part of the Netherlands, where we tend to spend most weekends and the odd vacation. This allows me to do plenty of walks through the woods and take pictures, which usually means I'm taking a camera with a single lens, no tripod, when we're walking together. And I also like going out alone in the early morning, taking a full kit attached a couple of the recent pictures look forward to your comments all the best from wim i tell you what wim talking about being lucky having a cabin in the middle of that oh fantastic i'll put wim's pictures up today so that you can see the uh, the images that he makes when he goes walking and they'll be on the show page as will all the pictures that we uh, that have been sent in for the photo walk over the last couple of weeks so they'll be on the show page too and i'll link to that of course in the the show notes on your app well, look, we mentioned um, Thomas Heaton, so let's, um, let's hear a bit of Thomas, shall we? The YouTube king of landscape photography. I think it's so much more accessible. Uh, all you've got to do is look at the ridiculous statistics of Instagram <laughs> to see how many yeah. images are posted on a daily basis. Now, granted, they're not all landscapes, but I tell you what, a lot of them are. Whether those people necessarily know that they're taking landscapes, mm. um, you know, it could just be somebody with a Google Pixel or an iPhone whatever, 11, I think we're up to now. <laughs> you know, those have incredibly good cameras, and if people are just out and about on holiday, or they, they see something, you know, maybe some nice mist or some unusual clouds or something, they'll take a photograph, they'll post it to Instagram. So, uh, the genre is has massively opened up, and the popularity has uh, grown more and more, but I don't necessarily think it's just a uh, increase in popularity of landscape photography. I think it's more of an increase in popularity of the outdoors. Can you hear that? Let me go quiet for a second. I hear somebody working in woodland with a saw. Obviously, I hear the birds. Um, there's a lot more aircraft in the air. Do you remember for a... Well, not necessarily in your country, but certainly in the UK for a little while. No aircraft. Nothing at all. Not even a private one. It was... Uh, that was this time last year everything went sort of strangely quiet didn't it it felt like christmas morning only quieter than christmas morning so uh, anyway thomas heaton from episode 71 a moment ago he is uh, by the way thomas is a big um, colombo fan like me and at the end of uh, our interview we were doing uh, just one more thing uh, which is of course how uh, colombo used to uh, to end his shows before he'd uh, solve the crime. So how's this for a, a neat connection? I don't just throw this together, you know. Last week in our Patreon area, which you can join, we did a piece called The Columbo List, where uh, I invited patrons to help me compile the ultimate list of questions that you wouldn't necessarily pose in the, if you like, the main interview on the Monday and Wednesday, which could be something like, a, well, it could be a real left-field question. That moment when Columbo turns in the detective show says, oh... Mr. James, just one more thing, sir. And then solves the crime. The, uh, the Columbo list questions, they're going to show up as, uh, I suppose, mini-episodes, if you like, in the, in the Patreon, which we call More PD. Should have called it MYPD, shouldn't I? <gasps> yeah, sort of nod towards Columbo, MYPD. 
Anyways, that Moore episode was called Legacy, President Kennedy and the Columbo List. And we talked about uh, your photographic legacy and what you leave to the world. We had a good old chat in the members area afterwards about all kinds of stuff. And up pops Andrew Higgins, who is a, a long-standing and very special member. And he mentioned a cautionary tale when it comes to looking after your photos. And uh, I suppose, by extension, your photographic legacy. Now, usually this would be for, uh, for patrons' eyes only, but uh, I asked his permission, and I'm going to invite you as my guest for a moment. Just sign your name at the door and collect your free introductory uh, Gary Baldies. This is what he wrote. Andrew said, Personally, I realised how ephemeral a photographic legacy can be last year. I have some stuff of uh, mine in a storage container, including my old negs and prints going back 40 or so years, which I thought was literally a steel vault to keep things in. Well, it certainly sounds like it, doesn't it, Andrew? But uh, in the freak bad weather in early 2020, the storage yard flooded. Oh, I just know where this story is going. And so did my container. In just a few hours, says Andrew, maybe 10 to 15 years of prints and negs were destroyed or damaged. A big chunk of my life and my photographic career gone. In brackets, thankfully, some of my early archives survived. Some compensation. I could be pretty stoic about it. What's gone is gone. But I felt really down that a part of my own legacy was washed away. And gloomily, I thought that uh, although since 2000 I've been almost totally digital... If I simply deleted a few hard drives, that would be my photographic life. And that's a huge part of my whole life. Pretty much all gone so easily, so effortlessly. Photographers and any creative in art, music, writing and radio who achieves some fame has their legacy preserved by that fame. But for the vast majority of us, we're like another Robert Blomfield. Uh, but maybe a little warning how prints, negs, digital files, your legacy. It's all potentially so ephemeral, says Sir Andrew. I tell you what, no wonder people spend such huge amounts of their time scanning their necks. My good friend Giles always seems to be scanning necks. Whenever I phone him, he says, I'm scanning necks. He's got a coffee in hand, scanning necks. It always sounds so, uh, such a sort of peaceful way to spend time to me. And just in case you're wondering who uh, Robert Blomfield was... Um, born in 1938, practising street photography in the UK from the late 1950s through to the early 70s. This pursuit ran alongside his medical studies at Edinburgh and subsequent years spent as a junior doctor in London. You should actually go and, and look him up. His, his work is um, well, it's, it's, it's just sublime street photography work. Great eye. Um, doctor and a photographer. I know a couple of those, actually. But uh, thank you to our wonderful members that support us, and of course one of those being uh, Andrew. And I'm sorry that you lost all those necks, Andrew. God, I can imagine how you've... Well, I can't imagine how you felt when you found out. But if you'd like to join Andrew, you can. For the uh, £3 a month plus sales tax, that's uh, working it out. Ding -ding. Even my maths is not that slow. £36 a year to get two extra thoughts for the week. And like those subjects, it's the, uh, I suppose it's the ultimate camera club, really. Because we all gather, have a chat. Some of us meet on Zoom once a month as well. There's different uh, levels of membership. And yeah, it uh, gives me a chance to do slightly different episodes on the Tuesday and Thursday. They're kind of a mixture of uh, Letter from America. Stroke, somebody said they sound a bit like John Peel's thoughts. If you live in this country, you'll know what I, what I'm, what I mean by that. And uh, Diary of a Photographer. We call it More PD. Anyway, head up. I've been looking at your emails. There's so much to photograph. I mean, this sort of... Uh, it's kind of like a meadow, really. Everything is springing. Spring is on the way. You are very talkative. Go on, give us another song. Right on cue. What do you think about... Uh, what do you think about Fujifilm? Oh, you're an Olympus user. I see. Oh, thank you very much. All right, OK. 
Oh, bless him, he's fluttering along, following me. Do you want to have a discussion, do you? What should we talk about? Camera bags. Oh. A donkey. Oh, nice. Yeah. Very wise decision. There we go, anyway. A, a little chat about Patreon, unashamedly, which is ultimately the way we're going to be able to hang about and do this long term, which I sincerely hope is possible, as I'd, I'd like to do... A, I really want to do some meetups, actually, including some travel uh, to, to make them. Yes, I do. Can I do it in a carbon-neutral fashion? Probably not, really. But talking of travel, remember Angelica Schneider, a guest last week, talking about making pilgrimages with your camera. She'd be making the Spanish Camino one. I, uh, I heard from her at the start of the week, actually. Hello, Neil. Enjoyed the Friday photo walk. I was about to write to you that uh, I'm still optimistic about walking this year when the headlines changed, and now it seems that it could be impossible this year to travel for holidays. Ah, she says. Anyway, how do you get all these interviews? The variety of topics is amazing. Angelica. Thank you, Angelica. And I'm really sorry to hear that... Uh, I'm really sorry, honestly. Rotten news that you're not going to be able to make the uh, Camino walk. But maybe these photo walks can be our kind of, uh, I don't know, virtual Camino of sorts. Not as good as the real one, but I'm trying here, Angelica. And then, uh, well, interviews. Well, where do they come from? Uh, I see people, I read about people. As you heard just a moment ago, photographers suggest them to me. And we're now at the stage, actually, where agents are contacting us too. Um, but generally and genuinely, there does need to be some sort of story. That's really important to me. We are, I am, we are, I am, the role we, about to introduce the uh, business editions. I'm just making a few sort of changes to the way that I recorded the first couple. I think they're going to be some, kind of like books, chapters, audio books. That's my thought at the moment, which will be at the weekend. But uh, really, th those are separate to the to the editions that we do on Monday and Wednesday. And, uh, of course, this week, again, very different... Uh, well, they were both photojournalists, actually, weren't they? We had uh, our winner of the Irish Press Awards, photog as a photographer, that is, James Crombie, and then Marissa Roth talking about that uh, extraordinary 35-year photography project. So, uh, yeah, great stories this week, and I promise more to come next week. Here's one from uh, Lynn Fraser. Hello, Lynn. Nice to hear from you. Morning, she says, just scrolling through Insta over my porridge. Already listened to PD. And have you seen... Uh, now, I'm going to get this right. And I checked it on YouTube. Ragnar Axelsson. His picture of the erupting Icelandic volcano. Epic, she says. It's the first time I've seen anything by him in colour. Love his work. Faces of the North and Arctic heroes both grace my bookshelf. And then I saw that Chris Burkhard had some, somehow got over to, to Iceland from the States to also shoot it. And I thought, well, that would be interesting. Get a native photographer's account of the event and then get the account of somebody flying over particularly to cover it. Wow. Lynn, I am halfway there. I'll put the uh, in the show notes today a link to... Uh, to Ragnar because uh, his work as Lynn rightly says is oh, just absolutely beautiful extraordinary work but uh, Chris I've written to haven't heard back yet Ragnar has said yes so he will be on and I'm looking forward to, uh, to chatting with him but while we're talking about adventure let's hear from another adventurer who was uh, on the podcast not too long ago do you remember Daniel Hughes from episode 155? The adventurist photographer, 8,848 metres up, to be precise. Uh, so I've always uh, ridden my bike. It's always something which I've had kind of deep passion for. Um, I guess I've always realised that I'm not too bad on a bike. I, I guess it was all down to Everest. So uh, winding back before that, um, I met some very poor children uh, on, a, on a mountainside in a city called Potosi. Mm. Uh, and I wanted to go back and try and raise the money for them. So the idea was to take a, a red nose with me and go and climb a mountain there called Aconcagua, yeah. which is the highest mountain in South America. Turns out that no one had done that before. So I then thought, well, I wonder if anyone had done one on Everest and, and no one had. Uh, so off I went with this mission to try and put a red nose on top of Mount Everest. Uh, but the charitable element wasn't enough. Um, I needed something else to kind of differentiate me from, from everyone else. 
Uh, even though I was reaching out to FedEx and saying, I'm going to be your red nose delivery man, track the red nose on their FedEx.com. Yeah. It just wasn't enough. And, and so te technology was, was my friend. So I thought to myself, well, what hasn't been done on Everest? And it turns out that no one had ever done a live video broadcast from the summit. Um, so that was now my mission. And two and a half years later, I successfully did that. Well, I made a video call to the BBC News Channel from the summit. I saw it. Um, yeah, I saw it. And, and that was from a smartphone. But so I guess that was my first ever kind of public usage of a camera uh, in terms of documenting my journey. Amazingly, I had access to all the photographic collection from the first summit in 1953. The Royal Geological Survey gave me the collection so I could compare their photographs, which George, George Lowe took to mine, which was amazing. But going back to your original question of how I got into cycling and photography, in that mission, I got sponsored by Gatorade and I went up there, I did some testing and it turns out that I actually wasn't too bad on the bike and uh, achieved the fourth highest power rating on the bike. So they said, you should be racing. The very talented Daniel Hughes, um, a professional, former professional cyclist, former military man, incredible uh, photographer, a very skilled drone operator actually as well. I still think climbing hills for fun on a bike though is reasonably bonkers. <laughs> so, says the uh, very fair weather cyclist. Uh, thanks to, uh, oh by the way, it's the Friday photo walk. Not that you need reminding because you're you're now well over halfway into this week's episode. But um, the idea, of course, is uh, I take out my camera, and you take out your camera, um, ideally to be consumed, this episode, while you're making your own kind of photo walk. Wherever you are, wherever you are in the world, making your pictures, spending some time, just, uh, just the two of us walking, those, uh, taking some something and nothing moments. And that's what this episode's all about. And thanks to some of the names who have their pics and links on display from their photo walks on the, on the show page. If you haven't been to the show page yet, because I know if you, if you just download the episode, there's no reason why you think, oh, I don't need to go to a show page. I'm hearing all I need to hear. But uh, we we'll put all the links from each of the episodes on, uh, to the show page. There's an individual show page for every single episode. It uh, often has a few pictures from the photographers that uh, I talk with. And, uh, and links to their website, maybe their Insta, other projects or stuff that we've talked about. I think, for example, in Mar Marissa Roth's case, yes, we, uh, I put a link in there for the camera that she talked about, the, the contacts camera. Do you remember that wonderful phrase she used? The camera is my sketch pad. And, of course, we also have the Facebook page, which I noticed uh, grew in number by a, you know, a modest amount last week, which I was very pleased with. If you've just joined us in that... Uh, facebook group welcome aboard you do have to ask for an invite but uh, we check your trainers as long as they're reasonably clean you're in and i do sometimes take uh, some of the bits that we talk about on this photo walk edition out from the facebook group as well there's some fantastic images in there of the ones that you make on on your photo walks James Turpin, thought I'd share a few shots from a recent photo walk, he says. Forgot the headphones, so I'm afraid uh, you didn't join me on this one. Oh, James, I rather like the contrast of new life against the gravestones in this shot. Yes, yeah, they'll be on the show page today. Flowers, new budding flowers, flowers that are just poking themselves out the ground and, of course, the juxtaposition of the, uh, of the graveyard. Quite clever, I thought. Thanks, James. And I'll put your Instagram account on the, the show page today. From our Copenhagen office. Hello, Neil. Bonafide miracle happened last week and I managed to go on an actual Friday photo walk. Whoa, he says, I snagged a few keepers to boot. See attached. Bit of a mixed bag, but I'm quite pleased with what I got, especially the shot through the window of the coffee shop. It's going to be on my website this very instant. Actually, I also nabbed that one. It's on the, it's on the show page. And it's in our, our new Instagram that we have for Photography Daily as well. Oh, just an extraordinary shot. Dennis. Oh, Dennis Skyam from Copenhagen. Marvellous photographer. But uh, that particular shot, I love it. Everything in that. It had, I mean, it had a shoot-through scene, real layers. It had a silhouette. It's about as close to everything you'd want in a picture as is perfectly possible. And of course, oh yes, and the other one, the terracotta wall. That was beautiful. That's on the show page as well. 
Uh, here's one from Richard Heinrich. I've been listening to your Friday Photo Walk podcast for a while now and decided I needed to use some of my old Pentax 6-7 lenses. Decided to get the uh, Photo Deox Pro Lens Mount Adapter um, so I could fit it onto my Fujifilm camera. The adapter is bigger than my 35mm to f2 lens. Yes, it does look like it, doesn't it? 45mm lens with an adapter that's bigger than your camera. I've been uh, shooting a lot of 4K video in black and white and wanted to see how a vintage lens would affect the perspective. I've uh, posted a few pics on the show page today so you can see the results. Love the mountain range, by the way, with a very deep contrasty cloud sitting heavy in the horizon. Oh, that was wonderful. As I say, I'll leave a link to Richard's work online and in particular his, uh, his travel page with the uh, glorious roads that sort of stretch out forever. I've always wanted to make a picture like that. You see those, um, the roads in America and Canada and, uh, and, and Australia, actually, that sort of stretch out. Nobody's on them. Miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. Nothing else happening. But I did see in one of your pictures, uh, there was a warning sign ahead of what looked like a valley with, uh, well, with, by the looks of it, it was a warning sign. It had three bees on it, which with my proper drama head on just says, killer bees ahead, beware. Do you get road signs like that? Richard, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned. I'm not, I'm not quite so sure I would follow that valley ahead. But uh, you can see his work on the website page today. And here's one from Gareth Lake. Recent convert to your podcast, found it just before Christmas, and have almost caught up. Episode 187. That does seem like you've been, <laughs> you've been doing an awful lot of listening, Gareth. But 187, of course, was, um, was Ed Cashy, wasn't it? I've been playing back, he says, at 1.5 speed. I wanted to say I really like the fact that you've opened up the show to people to send pictures in and get involved, as usually podcasts are interview-based only. So uh, kudos to you and those that take part. I fully intend to send some of my own in from the walks that I make on the often windswept Suffolk coast, where I think you'd like it because you can literally walk for miles without meeting anybody. I'm just an amateur. Ah, Gareth, straight away. You're never just... We should have a warning klaxon for that, shouldn't we? Never just. You are a photographer. But having picked up a camera again after nearly two decades of not using it, lockdown has renewed my interest to go out and take some photos again. It took a world pandemic to get me back into my photography, but I'm glad I have. Keep up the good work, and should you decide to visit Suffolk when this is all done, you'd be very welcome. I love Suffolk. We used to take, um, I think it was sort of the halfway during the year holiday, we, we'd, go, we'd go to Suffolk. We, we went to uh, my mum and dad to Southwold, which is uh, a very, very precious part of the world to me. And dad, actually, um, he has uh, a plaque on the beach. My mum put it there not long after he passed. But uh, I always forget where the plaque is. So uh, every time I return, I uh, go back onto the pier and take a... Uh, a tin of Brasso with me um, because that sea spray is not very kind to those plaques and I give it a good rub down. Uh, last time I was there, probably about a couple of years prior to the pandemic actually, I met a couple, I forgot my Brasso, and I, I, I met a couple who were going up and down and they were Brassoing everybody's plaques. So I led them towards Dad's and we had a good old chat about all the people that they meet as they're... Um, as they're polishing these, these plaques and the stories that they hear. I thought, what a fantastic way to spend time on that pier, just um, brassoing other people's plaques and listening to their family stories. Anyway, 187 you mentioned, Gareth. Episode 187 was Ed Cashy, wasn't it, from the Seven Agency? And that was a, an episode I, I really enjoyed. It was, I thoroughly enjoyed spending time talking with Ed. And he's agreed, actually, to come back and do another episode in vision, parts of which will be on uh, YouTube and parts of which will be, uh, I think we'll put them in the behind the scenes membership area. But uh, let's hear a bit of Ed. Photographic life lessons from a master. And that he is. Thankfully, I went to a university, Syracuse University in upstate New York, that has a, one of the best photojournalism programs in the world. And so I, for some reason, I pivoted and said, maybe I'll do photography. And it's so curious to look back and imagine like how that all happened then. But anyway, and then within two or three months of learning basic black and white darkroom photography, I was enthralled. It was like... I, I was addicted, you know. I Basically, I could imagine my life forever doing this and it never getting 
boring or repetitive or, you know, uh, and then what it tapped into were a few things. It, it was like synthesized my natural curiosity, my desire to sort of be a, a, a learner, which I, to this day, to the day I die, I will want to learn and try to understand things. But I, it was able to mix it with my social and political heart. Because I grew up in New York in the 60s and 70s, you know, where like the, the breast milk of that time was, was you know, anti-Vietnam War protests and women's rights, uh, civil rights movement, all these things, you know, environmental rights, Earth Day. All, this was like this blossoming mm. of progressive thought. Mm. And so that was deep in me. And also this desire to help people, to be engaged with people. So, so photography, thankfully for me, became this sort of, it synthesized all these different strands that were within me at a time where I had no clue because I didn't, I wasn't self-aware enough. Oh, the sun is shining. Oh, it feels marvelous. Now this, now this is what photo walks are supposed to be about. I haven't taken a single shot yet. <laughs> I will do. I think it's going to be one of those photo walks where uh, I've so enjoyed just having a chinwag with you that I'll probably, uh, I've got to sort of one end of a path um, and I, I might sort of turn round and take my time on the way back. I've actually brought a flask. Oh, Neil, how decadent of you. I might just uh, sit around for a while, listen to the bird song, right on cue, <laughs> and, um, and make some pictures on the way back towards car. I've left him for a long time today. He'll be proper grumpy. Uh, that was Ed Cashy anyway, the amazing work of Ed Cashy. From the Facebook group, if you're not a member, we've, we've mentioned this already, become one for this story alone. And then go look at all the other wonderful stuff from Alex Fredrickson, who talks about a uh, perfect story called The Professor. It's quite a long post, so <laughs> I think you just need to, to go onto Facebook and have a, a good look around for it. Uh, Jeremy Henderson put up a post on camera bags. Ah, you see now. Here we go, this is my real weakness. And we have a, a guest coming up actually called Joe Pugliesi, who's, um, I tell you what, he's a big name in LA. His, his online gallery is like, a, honestly, it's like a casting call of anybody who's famous. Um, and, and interestingly, I became reacquainted with uh, him and his work when I, I noticed his credit next to the pictures from that Oprah television show recently. And I, uh, I talked to him, and he admitted uh, his uh, his proper love of beating up old camera bags, and uh, the sort of the character of a of a beaten up camera bag. Mentioned Domkey, didn't we? Um, just a, a short while back, and I remember actually Giles, my good friend Giles, second mention in a week, Giles. That'll be two Garibaldis you owe me now. And uh, he, uh, when he came back from his service in the in the British Army as a as a photographer with them he had a he had a a, a camera bag and it was um, it was a, a black donkey I don't know how many liters because it goes by liters doesn't it camera bag this was and it was it was yeah it was properly scratched and scuffed and scruffed and and he was just about to throw it out and I said don't throw that out I'll have it I loved that bag, and I, I, and it, it was on its way out a little bit when he gave it to me, and I used it religiously for a couple of years for all my, for all my work, and um, uh, it, it must have attended I don't know 250, 300 weddings with me, and then gradually the strap was giving way, and ah, uh, oh, I missed that bag. But Jeremy in the, the Facebook group, he said, we all know that a camera is just a tool and no proper photographer asks somebody which one they use. But bags, that's totally different. Bags are important. So he said, Neil, maybe you could ask your guests next time. I do, and I did, and I will more often. And actually, now it's one of our Columbo list questions in the Patreon as well. Catherine Cunningham summed it up in these comments. She said, I, I put hangers up on the wall in a large room that I use for photography work, put my bags up on the hooks, and noted that I have quite an array across the wall now, from clear bag to Canon to expensive, and then $10 bags to uh, Pelican cases, and yet I'm always searching for the next perfect bag. See, we're talking exactly the same language, Catherine. If I could, I was talking about Giles's camera bag. Um, if I could have something that belonged to, uh, or belongs uh, to, uh, to a you know, well-known photographer, it's the camera. That is the camera bag. That's that's the thing that I would like above anything. Well, I'd like a print. 
the, the photographer I'm about to mention. I'd like a print. A signed one would be nice. But um, I was thinking Salgado. If you could have Sebastian Salgado's bag, wouldn't that be glorious? I mean, think of the travel. Think of the history. Think of the love. Oh, I'm getting very romantic about it, but uh, that's who I'd choose. One from Peter Langman. Hello, all. The camera in the group's banner page, and all our show art, actually, Peter, is, uh, is a Zorki 4, a lovely Soviet camera that you could uh, say is a, a, a Leica ripoff. I took delivery of one on Saturday, he says. It's a model from 1963. See, Peter, we're back here, aren't we? We're talking about uh, uh, legacy and history. I wonder what history that camera has. Model from 1963 in a lovely condition and paired with a Jupiter 8 50mm lens. I've collected four Soviet-era cameras now and developed a bit of a soft spot for them. This is my first Soviet 35mm and it hasn't disappointed. He popped some pictures in the Facebook group um, made, made with that camera. My advice, Peter, keep your doors locked tonight. I'm coming round for that camera. Now, I did go and it, onto eBay. Perhaps I shouldn't tell you this because you're going to go and bid against me now, aren't you? You proper sausage. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've bid on two. One is double the price of the other one. If I end up with both, I'll be a bit, disappoint <laughs> a bit disappointed. One's been tested and uh, works perfectly. The other one, I think, is a uh, bit of a mystery, but, um, but it's 100% uh, uh, ratings on the, on the seller. So I'm thinking, oh, I, I trust this. You know me, I like to get all my equipment, used equipment from MPB, but they, don't, they certainly don't have this kind of camera, I'm afraid. But uh, if, I'm, if I'm successful, I'm going to use it on one of my photo walks. And Giles, third mention, three Garibaldis, you can, do the, uh, you can do the deving for me. Last mail of the week. Oh, hang on. Last mail of the week time. Got to sing it. From Harry Tench. Just wanted to, say, uh, to write to say yes. Yes? Yes to what you were getting excited about on Wednesday's show with Marissa Roth. I'd see Marissa's Tibet story and hope you'll uh, have a bat one day to talk about it. Yeah, we didn't talk about that. I feel a bit guilty because there's some... Well, there was, <laughs> there was so much stuff we could, could have talked about with Marissa and I was aware it was a long episode anyway. In the meantime, the idea of having a camera as a sketch pad, he says, is just fantastic. Oh, yes, I mentioned that, didn't I? I should have known this, uh, this man was coming up and waited for that moment. It's fantastic, he says. I don't think I have my own sketchpad camera, mainly because everything I have is digital. Good, but digital. But I'm tempted to go back to a film camera and the contacts she talked about. Me? Copy? Why not? It was a wonderful concept. Yes, it was. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Uh, see, there we go. And the Zorki and all the other things that we've, we've talked about. With that in my mind, Marissa's contacts in Harry's mind, let's hear a, a little of uh, Marissa Roth again from Wednesday, episode 206. One person crying, women in war. Then I also think in some way I became a peace activist when I was 12 years old. Um, I was fully aware of the Vietnam War. I was fully aware of the peace movement, of the civil rights movement, the women's movement. I was always into rock and roll. My poor mother, I, I think I <laughs> drove her insane with Bob Dylan and Kraftwerk and, you know, <laughs> then Bruce Springsteen on full volume. And, uh, but I, I think I was really something was churning and it was the activism it was the uh you know the literature i was reading in high school i had some really pro progressive english teachers in high school so we were reading kurt vonnegut and Hermann hess and um and it was just a time of everything was sort of percolating and exploding and i had friends who had older siblings so i, I had a lot of different influences mm. but photography i mean i i, I I loved photography from an early age. I, I started taking pictures with my, my mom's Instamatic Kodak when I was like 11. Wonderful. Marissa Roth from Wednesday. And that's it for this week's Photo Walk. As I said, right near the start, your emails into this show to studio at photographydaily.show are what keep this alive with your photographic thoughts. And of course, that's the address to send your personal Photo Walk pictures into as well. Message me with your thoughts about the shows you hear, what's been said. Plus, our Facebook group is a great place to chat if you haven't joined it yet. 
Oh, come on, dive in. The water's warm, as they say. Some of what's said in there makes its way to the show now, too. In my days of being a radio presenter, many moons ago, I remember a producer saying, make sure, Neil, you remind them to write in, because often they think somebody else will get there first. It's pointless, they'll never get on, when that's just not the way. So, with that ringing in my ears, make sure to send me your pictures, 2,000 pics wide, please, and your thoughts and your messages. It's your mail that I'd really like to be reading next week. Talking of next week, Monday. Now, Thomas Kelly is on, who is a television producer, so not a photographer. Um, Well, a photographer of sorts, who worked on a documentary about the photographers in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, who went from photographing the stuff all local photographers do at the newspapers, such as check presentations, sporting events, business stories, to the next moment photographing, as it's mentioned in the doc, practically war during the years of the Troubles. Thomas Kelly on Shooting the Darkness and the incredible photographers he worked with on that programme. Then Wednesday, I mentioned him already, Joe Pugliesi, LA's go-to man when somebody important hits town. Of all the people we talk about, though, it's a particular story about photographing Mike Tyson that left me thinking... What a magical way you have of working with those you make portraits of. And patrons, Joe is the first person on the Thursday More show this coming week to share from the Columbo files. And what a personal story he shares too. A great way to start. If you want to join us in the Patreon group, you can. I'd love you to be there. It's very easy. Just go to the tab at the top of the website which says Patreon. My thanks to MPB.com and Studio Ninja for their extra support. Their end-to-end client management software designed for professional photographers takes less than 30 minutes to set up. Still has 50% off for your first year of use. If you enter the code PHOTODAILY50 when you go to studioninja.co. That link and all the other links will be on the show page today. If you made it this far, can you do something for me this weekend? If you get a moment, please. If you can, could you uh, take the URL of this episode by going to the show notes, of course, and and share it on your Facebook group, or maybe with your friends, or on Twitter, or all manner of places, just so we can spread the word out there. That really helps this show, it helps us grow, and it helps us get even more exciting guests for the future. Music in the show was from artslist.io, and I look forward to photographing with you hearing from you and talking with you next time car is going to be proper grumpy hello car hello where have you been well i took a bit longer today you know what with uh, jack being back at uh, school and thomas obviously meant that uh, i didn't have to sort of do it later on in the day i could sort of amble a bit more take my time take a flask out a flask what do you think this is train spotting don't be rude well, I've been sitting here all on my own. Quite worried I was, about to send out a search party. There you go. Yeah. Your boots look all right. Thanks very much. Yeah. Not so much mud this week. Well, you'll pass. Let's go home. All right. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.